Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this EPC policy dialogue, um, which is going to be focusing on Moldova after the elections. Maya Sandu's election in November 2020 and the more recent success of her party, uh, PAS, in July 2021 parliamentary elections means that not only does one party have control over the country, um, which is quite unique uh, for Moldova, um, but also the fact that it is a party um, that is dedicated to implementing real reforms, um, first and foremost for the benefit of Moldovan people, um, but also to enable to strengthen its relationship with the EU. Um, we also don't see the sort of business influence um, in government, at the top of the government, which has been the case uh, in previous uh, leaderships in the country. Now, the priorities uh, for the government have been cited as fighting against corruption, um, eradicating the role of oligarchs um, totally, so they're never seen again, um, judicial reform, uh, including um, firing corrupt judges uh, and prosecutors, um, have also been cited uh, as a priority. So this is, you know, very uh, ambitious. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the situation and the new dynamic in Moldova, um, the priorities and challenges that the government has. Uh, and of course, in terms of foreign policy, uh, relations with the EU and other players, uh, particularly Russia, um, but also China, which has a growing role in Moldova, as well as the larger region, along with issues such as regional security. Uh, and in that, we will also be discussing, you know, what next for the Transnistrian um, conflict. I'm really happy that we have three really great speakers um, joining us today who are really well informed um, on Moldova. Um, first of all, Stanislav Sekreriu, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, who's a senior analyst at the European Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris. Um, Ramona Strugariu, member of the European Parliament and vice chair of the delegation to EU and Moldova. Um, and last but not least, um, Martin Sieg, head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung um, for Moldova and also in Romania. So we have a great a group of people with us today. Um, just a quick word to the audience. Um, please, if you want to ask a question, and I hope you're all going to have questions, uh, you can either type it into the dialogue box, or alternatively, um, you can click on the on the icon for the, the microphone. And it's always good to hear other people's voices. So I'd really, you know, encourage people to give their questions um, vocally. Um, so I'm going to start this debate by um, asking uh, Stanislav um, to kick us off by giving a sort of picture um, of what's up, what's happening on the ground now in Moldova. I mean, what's the dynamic, what things have, have changed? Um, and also added to that, maybe you can also give us a picture of the COVID situation in the country and the main challenges that have emanated from that. So I hand the floor to you, uh, Stanislav. Thank you, Amanda, and I'm happy to join the discussion. Uh, I think I would like to provide a very general framework of what is happening in Moldova, what to expect in the coming month uh, and maybe years uh, in domestic politics, but also in foreign policy of Moldova. Uh, and I think um, it's really helpful to start with uh, some important takeaways of uh, elections. And basically, the results of elections are uh, somehow giving us the idea of what is going to happen in Moldova. So I basically will make five takeaways and we'll try to project them into the future and also mention what is uh, happening or happened during the last two months. So I think first important thing to uh, highlight is that elections produced a clear winner. Yeah, it's a party of action and solidarity. So basically parties secured a very comfortable majority of 63 uh, seats. And compared to 2019 elections, they gained plus 48 seats, which is a very impressive result. This clear win is a double-edged sword. It gives strong mandate to the new majority to govern on the one hand. It also sets society's expectations super high. What we will see and we already can observe is that the government will hurry to deliver as soon as possible, even on small things. 
because they know that society expects results. At the same time, we will see a growing criticism uh, on why government is not doing something or is doing things, but too slowly. Yeah? Uh, this is the dynamic to keep in mind for the coming month at least. Second takeaway, uh, which has impact on the immediate future. Party of Action and Solidarity received enough votes to govern alone. And uh, I, I need to highlight that it for the first time when a center-right political force in Moldova can govern alone. Now, this means that they don't have to engage in these uh, long coalition talks and give and take negotiations. Today, PASS can do things faster. So basically expect some decisions to be taken much faster than they've been before and the previous coalitions. And for, for instance, the government was uh, formed in the uh, record uh, time. Uh, majority submitted and passed in first reading some bills before summer vacation. So you already can see the faster pace of policy making and uh, legislative uh, uh, work. Uh, Obviously, uh, we can expect that opposition and vested interests will try to undermine this uh, advantage of uh, governing party, of being able to act faster. And what we can expect and see in the coming month is a sort of a legal warfare, yeah, more uh, requests of constitutional court to pronounce on the constitutionality or unconstitutionality of some bills passed by the parliament. We'll see media attacks and the use as well of compromise. Uh, third important takeaway, which we have to keep in mind, elections reconfirmed importance of Moldovan diaspora residing abroad. Majority of Moldovans are residing in Europe. So this was unprecedented number of uh, votes, uh, more than 2,100. And just to remind you that in 2019, parliamentary elections, there were only 7,400 votes abroad. So basically, number uh, more than doubled. And if you take the proportion of diaspora in the overall proportion of votes casted, it's 14%. Yeah. So it's important uh, political force outside of Moldova, which can shape the result of elections. And 86% of uh, people who voted abroad voted for PASS. Basically, they received the strong mandate and it will shape to some extent some policy actions of the uh, Moldovan government. Expect in the coming month more negotiations and signature of the social bilateral accord between Moldova and EU member states, especially where more Moldovans are residing in big numbers plus accords on the recognition of various types of documents. So basically, government will try to make life much easier for uh, Moldovans residing abroad. Fourth takeaway, uh, I think that uh, it's important to mention that past won elections on anti-corruption message. Yeah? And what you can see now in the Moldovan society is that people literally expect that from the very first day, government will send corrupt people to prison. This is how society thinks that government shall proceed immediately. You know? It's not realistic expectation. It's not possible. It's not done this way if you want to do a proper anti-corruption uh, uh, measures. But it shows uh, uh, how desperate is society for justice. Yeah? Uh, and I think we already kind of seeing some moves on justice reform and anti-corruption. And I think it will be the top priority. I, if, I, if I can say justice reform will be the mother of all reforms uh, in Moldova. Uh, I think uh, in the coming weeks uh, to watch the battle to replace the prosecutor general who is criticized for the fact that on his watch during this summer, a couple of uh, suspects uh, were able to leave uh, country, uh, as well to watch the activity of National Integrity Agency and efforts to boost its capacities uh, to review the declarations of public officials. It's interesting that we are reviewing the declaration of the former president, Igor Dodon. 
as well, uh, we will see how government will move on their plans to strengthen all the institutions which are uh, were created to fight corruption, like a National Anti-Corruption Center. But there is as well a plan to set up anti-corruption force as well. So uh, this is another thing to watch. Uh, let me make the last, I think, point. Um, I think uh, for past, and I, I, I will address what Amanda asked me to, I mean, the epidemic. I think PAS will be governing in a very difficult condition. So the expectations are high. The economic conditions are not that easy. Moldova uh, declined last, uh, GDP declined by 7%. The recovery is very slow. And in the middle of epidemic, uh, the Delta cases are pushing the inf infections high. Uh, and then I think one of the priorities of this government, in addition to fight corruption, uh, in addition to do reforms, will be to mobilize international support to fight COVID uh, uh, infection. It means uh, if need be, if need be more vaccines, uh, more various resources to combat pandemic, but as well uh, another priority to speed up economic recovery because it's very slow. And if you watch first moves of this government, they were passing certain laws which will clear the path to receive the second tranche of EU macrofinancial assistance. This is the priority. And then at the next stage, I think the more reforms and more legislation will be adopted in order to secure 600 million uh, euro from recovery plan uh, envisioned for Moldova by the European Union. Uh, I think as well for all these tasks, um, EU will work close, uh, Moldova will work very close uh, with EU institutions, but as well with uh, EU member states. And I would, uh, would like to highlight uh, the uh, relationship uh, of Republic of Moldova with Romania. Probably we're gonna see the deepening of this partnership because Romania is such an essential actor for Moldova and to uh, develop projects which will improve Moldova's energy security. Uh, Moldova, uh, Romania was a very important uh, uh, partner to fight COVID. I mean, most of the vaccines came from Romanian donation. And as well, uh, uh, Romania is essential actor for Moldova to access European market via transportation infrastructure. So we are gonna see some projects which will expand this infrastructure. There are plans to build a new, for instance, bridge. Uh, and I think just to conclude, if I would look from EU perspective, I think EU basically operates in the Eastern neighborhood in two modes. One mode is defense, is when EU is trying to defend reforms which have been implemented before, when EU is trying to prevent the democratic backslide. And there is offense, when EU is pushing for reforms, then there is a window of opportunity, uh, opens up after electoral cycles. Then there is a political will to do local uh, reforms and transformation. I think EU finds itself in Moldova in the second situation. This is a very big window of opportunity which is needed to be fully used. And I think I will conclude here and will be happy to address uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Stanislav, for this very good analysis, I would say, um, of the situation now in Moldova and there was a lot of points I think that we can still pick up pick up on um, later in the conversation um, but I would like now to move to uh, Mrs. Strugariu to sort of leave to start again where you left off uh, in terms of the relations with the EU I mean Moldova is an associate country it's also negotiates a DCFTA but it's had a sort of let's say up and down relationship with the EU I mean sometimes things have gone very well um, but other times, you know, finance has been frozen because the reform progress has stopped, um, etc. So, I mean, I would like to ask you, I mean, in your opinion, what does this election mean for um, EU-Moldova um, cooperation? I mean, what do you think should be the key priorities um, for Moldova 
uh, to focus on? And how do you think that the, the EU, I mean, EU leaders um, should be responding um, to this new, this new state of play um, in the country? Should they be doing more? Should, should they be upgrading in some way? I mean, the EU has a habit, habit of being very focused um, on one country for a while, and then it sort of disappears off the radar. Uh, and we certainly don't want that to happen with, um, with, with Moldova. So I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. I am honored to be um, with you today in such a um, um, wonderful company. I, I will take over from where my, my colleague um, finished. And I will also um, answer your, your questions because um, I think that it is so obvious that these elections, and, and I will be uh, um, uh, probably for some very courageous in stating this, but I think it is so obvious that these elections mean an open gate for the Republic of Moldova towards the European Union and towards a very close uh, cooperation and why not integration into the European uh, Union someday. I actually believe that this should be a priority for uh, the Republic of Moldova. And I think that it should be a priority for us as well. And I'm not talking necessarily about tomorrow, but I am talking about a commitment for this agenda. And, and uh, it was quite obvious that Maya Sandu and Pass showed clear signs of, committed, of commitment for this agenda. And the response of the European Union came. I mean, we are talking figures, we are talking the unprecedented six, uh, 600 million um, economic recovery uh, uh, and recovery package, obviously upon um, uh, condition uh, um, and related to the, the, the agenda on judicial and, and, and anti-corruption reforms. Uh, we're also talking about the, the, uh, the announcement of the President Charles Michel of 2.3 billion euro uh, investment package for the three countries, um, speaking about the trio agenda with Georgia, Moldova and uh, Ukraine. Um, we're talking about all of the open doors that Maya Sandu met uh, uh, while she was touring and meeting with the uh, European uh, uh, leaders and with um, a high level officials from the uh, institutions of the European Union. So it is quite obvious that Brussels has its doors wide open towards uh, uh, the Republic of Moldova and that we will continue to have them as long as the Republic of Moldova stays committed on this uh, path. Now, um, I, would, I would like to point out regarding the justice and anti-corruption agenda, which was rightfully mentioned by my, by, by my colleague, previous speaker as well, that, you know, this is not, of course, it's a very interesting topic for a campaign and an electoral campaign. And it, it has been on the agenda of the reformist uh, um, uh, parties and pro-European parties, uh, um, not only in the Republic of Moldova, but in several countries. But apart from the, the campaigning, the anti-corruption agenda has to be there because this is a prerequisite for the development of the country. There is no rule of law uh, without that. And there is no real opportunity for development if you look into all of the sections of the, uh, of the uh, society without making sure that you have checks and balances, that you have a strong judicial system fighting against corruption, uh, and that you have basically those pillars that could ensure proper uh, development and defend citizens and their safety. Because in the end, it is about, this, about legality and about the safety of each and every citizen in the country. Um, it will not be an easy road. I'm quite convinced about that. I know um, that the expectations are extremely high that things are happening tomorrow. Well, it will not happen tomorrow. It will happen in steps. There will be periods uh, of, uh, of enthusiasm and excitement, and there will be periods more complicated, maybe politically wise or economically wise. Uh, but one thing is certain, never ever before had Moldova such an opportunity. And never ever before had Moldova such a team um, ready to take advantage of such an opportunity. Because you have the presidency, and you have the government and you have the parliament and hopefully it will happen with the with the justice system as well um, 
uh, all these different actors fighting for the same values and and keeping the country in the same direction and and trying to uh, to upgrade and improve uh, um, th their efforts, uh, not only towards the European Union, but towards their own citizen. Because we all know that the contribution uh, of the European Union in Moldova and the, the contribution of Moldova to the European Union should be regarded in the same way. We need each other. It is not a one-way road. It is as important for the Union to have solid partners and one day members as it is for the Republic of Moldova to be part of this project. So I'm, I'm uh, happy that it is happening. At the same time, I'm fully aware that it will be a complicated uh, um, road if we look at the, the, the geostrategic perspective, if we look at the propaganda and disinformation, if we look at the, the energy security, which is an extremely important topic, um, if we look at many things, uh, and uh, you know, we've been having these discussions with other association countries. Uh, I've recently come back from Ukraine, uh, where I had excellent meetings at the um, at different levels, and um, um, we 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 meet the same uh, uh, concerns and the same. Um, aspirations and um, some questions are the same basically in all of these countries. Uh, but at the same time, um, at least three of them have a more distinct path towards European integration. And what I believe is that without discriminating against the others, we must find forms to support them in their endeavor to get there. Because once you have the political will, once you have the very clear message of the citizen that they are aiming into that direction, and I'm not talking only about the vote here, but I'm talking also about all of the um, uh, the indications and the um, very high percentages of populations responding to different types of questionnaires and stating that they do believe in this pro-European road. Uh, of, of Moldova and in the European Union. So I think we definitely need, and, and Moldova needs to take advantage of this um, as well. We are prepared to, to support this. We actually wrote in the Romanian delegation um, in the, the Renew Europe group um, of the European Parliament wrote a letter to, to um, uh, Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen in the aftermath of the elections asking for uh, uh, for support for Moldova. Um, we are definitely committed from this side to uh, enhance this uh, support uh, in its different um, aspects, like I was saying, because it is important on the, the side of the justice reforms and it is important on the economic side. It is very important on the side of countering the effects of the pandemic and fighting the disease, literally. And here I'm, I'm quite happy that Romania uh, uh, helped and I hope it will continue to, to, to help and to, to stay close and come close in very concrete ways to the Republic of Moldova. And um, all that I can hope is that we will definitely meet one day in the European Union uh, and we will do our best to make, uh, to make this uh, a, a reality. Uh, I'm confident and, and I'm saying it with a very open heart uh, and I'm happy that it, it, it's um, uh, happening. At the same time, fully aware that there will be ups and downs, but we are there for the ups and we are there for the downs as well, like we were before when the situation was very complicated politically and we did not give up because the people are those who are benefiting from this project, not politicians. Politicians have a mandate, but the people are the ultimate beneficiaries of this effort and I think they deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, I'll be back in back with you shortly for a second question, um, but I just want to turn now to to Martin. Um, Martin, I mean we've heard that reform um, in many different sectors is a priority and clearly the people at the top um, are very committed, but I'd like to ask you, I mean, is there going to be a, ch a challenge um, of capacity, first of all, um, within, within the government, within the ministries, um, and also when it comes to the fight against, against corruption, you know, are we sort of 
in a similar situation as in Ukraine and elsewhere, where, where some of the people lower down um, aren't quite as committed to uh, corruption and are willing to continue to do corrupt things. Um, and what can be done um, about that? That would be the first question. Um, and my second question is actually related to your own country, because I mean, you're from you're from Germany. I mean, Germany is obviously um, probably the most important country in the in the EU. Um, so what uh, I mean, how important to, to, to Germany um, is is Moldova? I mean, is Germany going to throw all its weight behind, um, you know, Moldova in terms of pushing forward or, or promoting um, Moldova's, you know, close approximation um, to the EU, you know, within the framework of this new reformist leadership? Well, uh, you know, as a German, I need first to start arguing whether we are the most important country in the European Union. I think once uh, Germans start claiming that for themselves, they will find themselves in, you know, very troubled waters. Um, <clears throat> the role of Germany, uh, of course, Germany has been quite supportive already to, I think, the current people in government when they were on, op on opposition, of course, within the constraints of diplomatic relations and what was possible. And there is certainly a high level of goodwill, a high level of support. My own president is going still this month to Chisinau. I think that's also going to be quite a signal that, yes, uh, there's going to be support. Of course, on the long run, <clears throat> you have neighboring countries, and I, and I agree with, uh, with both speakers before, the role of Romania for Moldova is probably, you know, even a little bit more strategic in the long run. And I think the relationship over the last half a year at least, since the beginning of the year and Maya Sandu's victory was one of really very significant support from Bucharest. So it's not all about Germany in that respect, uh, but I'm happy to say that my own country, I would very much rely, <coughs> I do rely that there is a lot of support coming politically, economically and so on. You spoke about capacity and that indeed is the one crucial thing. Um, positive outlook is, uh, and Stanislav has already emphasized it, we have here, and perhaps not only in Moldova, that perhaps goes for the broader region, uh, for the first time ever a government that is really free from oligarchic or corrupt power. Um, that's a new, and that's also why this is probably indeed the best chance of, of Moldova. But I think it's also the last chance, uh, because this is here the last charge in a way. The really crucial date uh, for the change of Moldova has actually not been the last elections. That was a vindication of success, but the real crucial date was in June 2019 when Plachodnuk was ousted. If that would not have happened, it would have been game over because I think democratic and pro-Western serious forces would have simply gone extinct. You know, first by suppression, by uh, um, starving them out economically and financially and people simply leaving the country. Now, uh, thereafter, you know, we had, of course, a different geopolitical uh, um, uh, uh, setup in the country. Uh, but in that respect, I would like to remind everybody that we have two struggles. One is more superficial than the other in Moldova. The one is geopolitical, it's pro-Western, pro-Eastern, you know, pro-European, pro-Russian, if you may say. That has always been the more superficial one. The other one, far more crucial for the future of the country, is whether you have people seriously fighting for democracy and the rule of law, and on the other hand, organized crime capturing state institutions. And whether these kind of, uh, of, uh, of organized crime, you know, raises a Russian flag or a European flag is actually quite secondary. Plachotnuk raised a European flag, and he was by far the worst example so far uh, ever since. Uh, even when Dodon was ruling the show, this kind of arbitrary use of justice against political opponents, this kind of suspicion, uh, suppression strategies, that didn't happen. And this is also one of the reasons why PAS could win the election. <clears throat> so uh, it's not all pro-Western, uh, pro-Eastern. And one final remark in that respect, because it's really important, Maya, Sandu and PAS are, of course, with respect to values and aims, that it is about a market economy, that's about the rule of law, democracy, good governance, of course, 
a party with the best European credentials that ever existed in the country. But they didn't win on a, on a pro-European agenda. They won on a pro-Moldovan agenda. They could really transmit to a majority of the population uh, in, uh, a feeling of hope. Uh, you may say some kind of a feeling, yes, we can Moldovan sense that for the first time in a major election campaign breach the traditional divisions of identity without, within Moldovan society. Um, I have uh, a most recent opinion poll, read it as of September 1st, shows 76% approval rating for the president. 76%. And that means uh, in a, that we have in a country where perhaps 40% of the population is predominantly Russian speaking, gets all their information from Russian media, where 80% of mass media are in the hands of political opponents, and very heavy still on fake news and propaganda. So it shows what kind of ability uh, Maya Sandu and her party had uh, to reach out to a broad society, to Russian speakers as well as others. And therefore, you know, I can always warn to uh, consider that election as uh, one of a geopolitical choice, pro-European and so on. I would even say that as important it is, of course, to, uh, to promote the European integration of Moldova, the real key thing is what is happening in Chisinau itself. Reforms, of course, justice is crucial. What happens with the prosecutor general is crucial. If there needs to be change. There needs to be change with the Supreme Council of Magistrates, uh, the Anti-Corruption Center, the uh, National Integrity Commissions, a lot of institutions that were used to do precisely the opposite of what actually their theoretical mandate is. And you still have a state with many institutions uh, where organized crime is deeply embedded. That does not necessarily mean that all Moldovan officials are corrupt. There are a lot of decent people in the institutions and not everybody in the institution, you know, was practically taken over by Plachotnog and so on, but still, you know, it's organized crime ruling the game. Uh, you have a huge percentage of state enterprises completely in transparency and in the past simply used as fiefdoms uh, from which to take revenue. The whole economy was used to be practically monopolized. And you have uh, on the Western border and you have also in the Eastern line, huge business models circling around all sorts of smuggling operations and so on, probably with annual turnovers of hundreds of millions. And against that is now standing a new government. Yes, that has a majority in parliament, a very comfortable majority, and that has a government. But of course, there is also the big problem that so many people have left the country. You have an emigration of the, of the elites in particular that is astonishing. Uh, I would not be surprised, I don't have any kind of figure, but that in the last couple of years, for a long time already, probably half of every year's university graduates have left. You have a country which I think has statistically, you know, still approximately between three and a half and three million and probably is rather closing uh, on a, on a kind of, you know, losing more and more people going down to two million with only a workforce now of 800,000 people in the country. Also in clear indication, this country is not going to be economically sustainable on the long run. Capacity wise, the government needs to find enough people. It needs to focus and so on. It is not simply a matter of replacing judges and so on, because quite frankly speaking, if you can replace all the corrupt judges, that would be fine theoretically if you get them out, but where does a replacement actually come from? This is already where it starts. This is also why expectations uh, needs, of course, to be limited and focused, and focused where it really matters. Prosecutor general matters. Uh, Supreme Council of Magistrate measures. So to make at least sure that a corrupt system doesn't work by, you know, senior magistrates, which are corrupt, co-opting junior magistrates that are also corrupt, right? You need to, 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 to start it top down. Western support is, of course, absolutely crucial. European support is, is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and there are, of course, use packages underway, and the country is going to need that, most certainly. A question is also how the European Union in the in the future can also support that via missions. Uh, vetting of judges is a crucial thing. And we will see justice reforms that by necessity also mean that on a at least abstract sense, there will need to be infringement on the independence of justice. You know, if the justice system itself has been 
not every judge, of course, or not every prosecutor, but the justice system at all have been a center of abuse of power, you need to change it. And you can't change it if it remains independent. Now, how to change it in a way to ensure that, you know, both the image, the trust in the system, and the reality doesn't mean that one political force be replaced by another one. You need external support for capacity, but also as some kind of a guarantee. European Union is the only institution in the world I know who could help here with vetting missions and so on. We had that in the Western Balkans occasionally and, and in other places. That's a way of going. Overall, the European Union should also think about being more flexible and more political. The macroeconomic aid we have seen, uh, which at the moment is, of course, hugely important, indispensable for the new government to succeed, but it also helped in the past somebody like Plachotnuk to survive. And the European Union has never been flexible enough in really employing these instruments so that we could really sure that we're going to support the right people. And you can run this with many other projects. Very often, European help is a little bit too bureaucratic and so on. You know, sometimes, you know, need is, and in most cases, uh, help is needed within months, not within years. And this is something where Brussels needs, needs really and significantly to work on. Everything that you can do in a year is, is, is probably half of the value it is yet. And thinking about politics, thinking about these things, we used to operate, of course, in the usual framework of bilateral relations. We used to think uh, that transformation and change in a country like Moldova could happen like, let's say, in Poland, or could happen, you know, like in Romania where you had a broad consensus between local elites uh, and the European Union, what should be the end game in terms of democracy and rule of law? So one supported each other. But a country like Moldova, even if uh, superficially you always had elections, has never really been a democracy in our sense. Uh, and if you speak about democracy and the rule of law, and still after that victory, it's still largely a receipt for regime change. And that's what the Eastern Partnership, if you take its value series, is actually aiming for. But this is something which I think the European Union has never really admitted to itself, uh, that it is a different set of, that can't work like in Poland and in Romania, that you need leverage, that you need to distinguish between your partners, and that you cannot take what to deal with one government like with the other government that you need to change. Other actors have, of course, had less reservations and less restrictions. Uh, when Plachotnuk fell, for instance, well, the considerable part of the media market were up for grabs. And you can imagine how important that was. Guess who moved in and took over while all the West was standing aside? And uh, these are things uh, that really matter. One million for media, one million for the right political force is worse more often than 100 million on budget support, uh, which can help the oligarch just as well uh, as it can help, you know, a serious uh, uh, change for reform. Taking this all, all together, I uh, happily uh, repeat, I fully agree with the speakers. It's the best chance that Moldova ever had, and the prospects look bright. But given the very, very limited resources in terms of human resources, given the deeply entrenched uh, forces which are going to oppose that, the huge amount of financial power and also of annual turnover, which essentially organized crime, still controlling a lot of institution, uh, still controls, given that factor, it is in no means certain that the country is going to succeed, which is a you know, considerable call, of course, for support and serious support and fast support. It also means that because of this massive emigration that the country had seen, it's not only the best chance, it's probably also the last chance, because if they're going to fail, I don't see in the country the nucleus, again, to, to, to seriously try and build another force uh, who would then succeed. Uh, so uh, I'll probably stop here, and then we can go into a discussion. Thank you, Martin, as well, for this very good analysis. You know, failure is not an option. Um, this is what we can take away. Way. Um, but now I want to give the audience a chance to put some some of their questions before we try and if we have time to touch on foreign policy. So I would like, first of all, for my colleague to unmute Stefan um, Mora, who has his hand up. Stefan, are you yeah, there? Sure. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Stefan Mora. I'm a researcher at the University of Montreal. I'm doing my PhD 
uh, now on uh, on Transnistria, which I suppose it's the elephant in the room. Um, I don't know, maybe I entered a bit too late and uh, someone already touched upon the subject of Transnistria, but me, uh, it's my third year uh, since I'm here in Tiraspol researching for my PhD the thesis, right? So I kind of always uh, like to, to raise this question of Transnistria. And of course, we can, talk about, uh, we can talk about European integration of Moldova, but which Moldova are we talking about? Are we talking about a Moldova with, with Transnistria or without Transnistria? Yeah. Uh, first, in order to, in order to, to uh, join the European Union, uh, you have to fulfill the Copenhagen criteria, which everybody knows. Uh, but we also know that the EU is facing a kind of um, Europeanization fatigue, right? In which we remember Romano Prodi saying that uh, everything, we give you everything but institutions. And this is all about in the Eastern Partnership, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and in 2018, we saw, of course, the, the expansion plan of the, of the European Commission. We saw uh, that it was focused on the six, six Balkan countries. And we saw also Chancellor Mer Merkel uh, talking about uh, the Western Balkans as a priority. So Moldova is I'm far sorry, away from I, this. Can I ask yeah. you just to, to, to sort of wrap sure. up? I will, quite I will short, yes. please. Thank I will you. Go to, yes. Uh, so the question is, what are we doing with Transnistria and what's the, the role, if you want, of the European Union in transforming the Transnistrian conflict in such a way that uh, integration is possible? Thank you. Thank you. And then I want to give the floor to Dennis um, Chenusa, if he's there. Dennis? Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for a very interesting... Yes. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank Go you, ahead. Amanda. Please. Yeah, thank you, Amanda, for moderation and to the speakers for interesting insights. Uh, my question is rather about the objectivity of assessment of the situation on the ground in Moldova. From what I know and from my observations, my talks with colleagues uh, from the civil society, we know that not everything is perfect in terms of the way the government is implementing the reforms. And the biggest problem and concern, of course, is that the transparency principles, which is a part of good governance uh, concept uh, uh, in general, as well as part of the political conditionality for the macrofinancial assistance of the EU, is not fully respected. And um, I, I'm trying to understand whether there is an, a, a clear assessment of that from the EU institutions and from Brussels, because uh, in Moldova, there are suspicions that probably the EU is so much overwhelmed and so excited by the positive changes that obviously took place in Moldova that they try to probably turn a blind eye on, on this uh, important um, deviations from the transparency principles, which could be both detriment detrimental both to the EU image in Moldova, as well as for the uh, plans of the government to, uh, to implement important reforms in the longer run. Thank you again. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I have two written questions here that I'm also going to put. The first one is for you, um, Stanislav. Um, and it's asking about the associate um, trio is from Dimitro uh, Shukurko. What do you think about this? Does, does, does Moldova feel stronger with Ukraine um, and Georgia? Um, so to have your perspectives on this. And then the last question is from Daya Gontasarova, and it's to everybody. And she's asking about expectations um, for the upcoming Eastern Partnership um, Summit. Um, and if I may, I would also add one question, and that's basically um, to ask about the role now of, of our external players in Moldova, I mean, particularly Russia, um, but also China. I mean, the role of China, I mean, we've heard that in the past that Moldova was getting perhaps too close to the Chinese or on the edge of getting too close to the Chinese. Um, is this still the same or has there sort of been a backtracking? Um, and the role of other countries, I mean, Turkey comes to my mind, of course. Um, so that would be my question. Um, but maybe we start with you, um, Stanislav, then we'll, we'll go around again um, across the, the colleagues. A lot of uh, great questions. Thank you. I, I will not address all of them. I just picked a couple because otherwise I think uh, my colleagues on the panel will have no time. 
I think first there was a question about the biggest challenge for Maya Sandu as the president and her majority. I think justice reform. And the argument is that there was before adopted legislation which empowered self-governance bodies of prosecutor and uh, judiciary without cleaning these bodies before and staffing them with uh, people with high integrity. Now to undo this and to replace them is more difficult uh, than it was uh, before adopting that, uh, these laws. Uh, second, on the um, uh, question about TRIO, you know, I'm not speaking in my private capacity uh, and I'm not speaking in the capacity as a Moldovan citizen. I'm speaking in the capacity of uh, expert who is working for European think tank. First, it's a caveat. And then second, uh, I think TRIO is a nice idea. Um, it's useful for these three countries to exchange um, uh, good practices, to let each other know where they failed so that others will not repeat the same mistakes. It's easy to push together, uh, I think, you know, Ukraine in 2000s were, was uh, demanding things which later were offered by you to Georgia and Moldova. So from this perspective, Moldova benefited of uh, Ukraine being uh, very active in terms of asking from institutions more and more. Second thing, uh, uh, there was a very uh, excellent preparation when uh, I think Moldovan government uh, took some practices from Georgia how to conduct uh, reforms of police. So obviously these three countries have a lot of things to learn and share and as well to work together uh, in relationship with the uh, EU institutions. So I think this, this, this is a very useful format, but it cannot replace two things. Uh, it cannot replace reforms, which each country has to do and deliver and Georgia and Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, and I think uh, the thing is that Sometimes we are trying or we see attempts to play more geopolitics and less to do reforms. Uh, and second thing, um, there is a, a attitude where there are different situations, security situations in these countries. You know, in Ukraine, there is ongoing war. Uh, in Georgia, where there is a difficult situation with continuous borderization. And in Moldova is a bit quieter than in those uh, two uh, conflict areas. And then Moldovan government has a, a bit different perspective, which allows me to jump to Transnistria. Yeah? Uh, Transnistria considered the most peaceful uh, place uh, out of those uh, several protracted conflicts. And it's considered that it's relatively easy to solve. Well, it's not, it's not that easy to solve this uh, issue. There is a very entrenched deep status quo, which uh, was supported as well by some shadow business elites in uh, Kishino. And I think one of the tasks of a new government in relationship with, trans with Transnistria will be to cut out these uh, corruption networks, which were connecting left and right bank of Transnistria. And I don't think it will make many people in Tiraspol very happy. Uh, second thing, uh, there are elections in Transnistria this summer for so-called position of a president. So I don't think many things will happen until the end of this year on Transnistrian file. And third element, which I would highlight is that Moldova, all the vaccines which it received from international donors, between 10 and 15% of all vaccines were automatically sent to Transnistria as well tests for COVID were done in Kishinev. So there was a lot of cooperation on the level of uh, medical institutions and units. And this is a very good way to sort of build trust yeah, and build some ground for maybe in future for more serious talks. I think in Kishinev the view to our transition conflict is a bit deprioritized, not interest of Moldovans living there, but as such, the file is a bit deprioritized because first, uh, Moldovan government has a very limited human resources and their priority is to focus on domestic reforms because Moldova internally is too weak to reintegrate Transnistria on the good terms for, for, for Moldova. And then there is a very skeptical view that it's a good time and Russia is in a position to have uh, frank uh, discussions and to have 
uh, some concessions which will make this solution sustainable and will not make Moldova more dysfunctional, but will make it more functional as a result of the solution. So I don't see a solution in the, in the near term. At the same time, you have significantly increased its presence and influence in the Transnistrian file over the last 20 years. So I wouldn't say that nothing has changed. And I think you can make a contribution and to increase its profile if it will support the idea of utilization of munitions in Kalbasna, around 20,000 uh, tons of old munition from uh, left there from the Soviet times. Uh, if you or you member states can step in and internationalize the proposal of the Russian government, it will be a significant contribution on the EU side to move a bit further uh, the situation in Transnistria in the good uh, direction. Uh, I think, uh, well, there were plenty of questions, but I, I stop here and I, I will let uh, my fellows on the panel to pick the rest. Thank you, um, Stanislav. I want to give the floor back to you, Mark. Now, Mrs. Strugariu, perhaps you can also address the issue of the expectations for Eastern Partnership and also the, the associate trio. I mean, there's been I mean there's been some speculation this could mean the end of Eastern Partnership, um, given the fact that you'd more or less only have Armenia and, and Azerbaijan. Yes, um, I, I, I would left. I would I would happily address this um uh, and and then that we have had discussions ex extensive discussions related to that as well but very briefly on transnistria and very briefly on on the situation on the ground i know there were several questions um look at this history of frozen conflict um and and russia's uh, power play in the region um turning the frozen conflict into a chronic disease uh for the region, the, the region using this in a uh, um, you know a geo strategic uh, a context that should not leave us uh, um, without reaction. And when when I say not leave us without reaction, I'm talking about the union. I'm talking about what we can do at this level. Um, this is this is something that has not been. I mean, it's not new. Whether we talk about uh, Abkhazia or South Ossetia or Crimea or Transnistria, we know very, very well that that, uh, um, that, that this has been um, Russia's uh, power game for uh, a long time. And this is not something that the countries, these three countries, because we are particularly talking about them, should be left uh, to handle by themselves. And, and to be honest, I think that here it has also a lot to do with what the European Union uh, decides to do with uh, uh, Russia's aggressive uh, politics and with the Russian propaganda and uh, our whole relationship, um, because the associated partners and the associated countries are also part of this project through an association form, it is very true, but they are part of this project. So we're not building two separate worlds here. I think that our responsibility towards this topic and our approach towards this topic and our direct relationship with, with Russia uh, is it has to include this very sensitive topic uh, of, of the frozen conflicts and of this, uh, this uh, particular situations and different forms of Russian aggressive. As a, uh, um, uh, aggressive politics as a whole. It is our responsibility as well in the end. And we should have our answers to that in the end uh, uh, as well. Probably a, a lot more powerful and a lot more articulated with more instruments, uh, including uh, economic instruments and uh, um, negotiations and you know uh, high level politics, uh, more significantly more instruments than each and every country uh, that has a frozen conflict would have by itself. And this is the reason that, that, that uh, we, we uh, are basically uh, in the same story so that we could, you know, can support each other. So I'm not saying, I don't know if, if, if just to be, to be precise in answering the question with or without Sonsnistra, I, have, I, I don't know the answer to this question, but we should ask ourselves and these three countries should discuss extensively about this and ways to approach this with the perspective of a maybe real integration um, window. 
because what I believe that on our side we should give to the Republic of Moldova now is a clear perspective for joining the EU. I'm not saying that it is tomorrow or in a year or in, in three, three years, but this clear perspective has to happen. And then going back to the trio um, approach, um, I, I, I think it is a statement. I do not think that it is the beginning of the, the end, to be honest. I think it's first and foremost, a very clear statement from, from these three countries that they are fully supportive uh, uh, for, for, for the, the European agenda and that they need more encouragement and clearer ways uh, for, for gaining our uh, support in return. And I, and I believe this should not, again, should not be left without an answer on the EU side. Yes, we need to be, to, to, to be very careful in how we address this, so we do not so that we do not create the feeling that we are discriminating against certain countries within the Eastern Partnership. But at the same time, I believe that we should definitely encourage those countries with a real progress in the same direction that we are committed to, both partners, both sides. Um, so, um, yes, in, in terms of transparency of the government in Kishinev, I think that was another question they did not answer. Uh, I, I do not have any information. I don't think that we should use a double uh, mirror uh, if there are any signs of, of, of uh, concern or any particular situations in this sense. Um, I and we will be happy to look at them. I, they didn't. This kind of information didn't reach me or 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 my colleagues, as far as I know. Uh, but I'm not saying that we should have double standards, and and I'm also not saying that we're being blinded by the the the, the beauty of the moment. I don't I don't think so. You know, there's no perfect government, and there is no perfect democracy. It's just you know, democracy is just the the best existing uh, existing form of gov governance. Nobody says it's perfect. But in, in history, while testing different forms, we, we could only conclude that, that that's um, the, the best one, definitely there are ways of, of improvement from the existing ones. Um, same thing with the, 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 the government, same thing with the, uh, uh, their um, willingness to implement reforms versus different flows in the system or, or different situations where people may be wrong or they may make mistakes or certain situations uh, may happen but i think the essential point is to be able to admit when you make a mistake um to 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 be able to uh, fix it in and and also have the tools to fix it you know speaking about transparency independence the justice system and so on uh and not to prove mal malvolence in, in uh, uh, promoting a certain types of policy or, or another. Uh, I think that the, 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 the intention of, of actually delivering and having good results and uh, uh, standing up for the, 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 the right causes is extremely important because everybody makes mistakes. But the context uh, and the, 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 the the nature of these mistakes and what, what lies behind, I think, are extremely important in explaining a certain situation or another. And very briefly also, because I, I'm afraid that I will shortly have to go on to another meeting and then to the plenary, um, about the diaspora and the human resources in the Republic of Moldova. Um, I, I had the privilege of meeting some of these people in the, in the, in the, in the Moldovan diaspora. They are fabulous people very open to the world, extremely enthusiastic, a lot like many of us in the Romanian diaspora when we supported uh, different types of elections in Romania with the hope for a better future. Now, all of these people are an extremely important human resource uh, that could be used about, you know, in terms of expertise, it could also be uh, used in, in, in terms of uh, setting up expectations of, at the level of the, the population in the country, because they can definitely explain some things, having this broader European perspective and seeing how things happen in other countries as well, and with ups and downs, because let's be serious, there's no perfect European country and there's no perfect, perfect EU member state. 
there's no such thing like you know perfection and, and full uh, commitment and full uh, so in speaking about the Copenhagen criteria by the way um, going back to the the way the the, the, the the times that we are going through right now and looking at the member states and doing a very thorough screening of the Copenhagen criteria I'm not sure that so many member states will actually fully fulfill those criteria today as we speak this is an ongoing battle with ups and downs and and with uh, basically a day by day fight for the rule of law for democracy uh, for uh, also resilience in, in terms of uh, threats like Russia and so on it is a matter of choice on which side we decide to carry this battle is it on the European side is it through a very clear approach and agenda uh, on, on on this uh, in this direction or is it through I don't know other um, special partners like like some of those that you mentioned like china and turkey and so on uh, that would not be as committed and as honest in their partnership as the european union is uh so uh yes i'm i'm basically concluding and sorry if i've, I've been uh, too long by by stating that i remain optimistic and that i think that you know politically we we, we should be used and facilitate um, this, uh, this this road for the Republic of Moldova. And, and so is diaspora, which will not come back tomorrow in the country, by the way. But if the country creates that environment for, for predictability and for stability and for decent working places, and I'm, I'm quite sure that a number of these people would come back and would stay there because they're missing their country. And I know how it is. I grew, you know, I, 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 I've been through such an experience and I would do the same thing myself. Uh, uh, if if uh, the conditions were met, and we're basically working every day on building up these conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You made a lot of important points there, um, but unfortunately we were coming to the end. Um, so I need to give the floor now to Martin to um, get your take on you know a couple of the questions that were put there. I, I tried to do it briefly. Transnistria, <clears throat> not very optimistic whether any initiative anytime soon makes sense. Uh, quite simply, the question was raised, which Moldova, implying with or without Transnistria, when you can put the question differently, which Moldova actually would Transnistria unite with? You know, is it, you know, uh, a, a mafia state? Uh, is it uh, uh, a patronal, pro-Russian, half-authoritarian system, or it is a European-like democracy rule of law? This question is not decided. We had all these three kind of models on the table in the, within just three years. And you know, whoever in Moscow or in Tiraspol would actually know with whom to negotiate on the long run. You don't make a deal with Maya Sandu, uh, you make a deal with Moldova. Uh, so unless that is decided, hardly any chance, because nobody really knows what kind of state is that actually going to be at the moment. Uh, second point, with in Moldova, there is not even remotely any kind of consensus, because it was never really discussed by governments, what a common state with Transnistria would actually look like. Uh, and if you go into that discussion, well, that's what you discuss for years, and you don't discuss reforms and anything else. So my strong advice would actually be, uh, and I say that with regret, right? it's, it's very limited what you can do with the existing resources, but you can do reform or you can do conflict settlement. You cannot do both at the same time. And so my advice to the government would always be, you know, with Transnistria, you know, look for the decent status quo, don't go into conflicts, you know, do, you, do your homework on reforms at home. But however, for reforms and transparency, it is highly important to be realistic what's possible. Uh, there is massive time frame. It may well be that for changing the country, there's only one legislative term with very limited human resources. And not make it too complicated by having unrealistic demands. Uh, the question of transparency in particular, what does it actually mean? Transparency in which, in which way? Uh, we have the experience of the government in 2019, the short and brief period where Maya was uh, Maya Sandu was prime minister, where a lot of time was actually lost with you know setting up commissions here and there for this and that position. And in the end, we all figured out the persons you actually want there didn't even apply because they didn't trust the system. 
uh, of, of transparency. My advice would always be, for instance, you have a decent person for the National Integrity Commission, you have a decent person for the, for the, for the uh, Competition Council, appoint him, appoint him today. Don't bother very much with procedures. In Germany or in France, such positions are also uh, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not appointed by commission. And by transparency, the government chooses a person they have. And with most, most reforms are not because of laws in parliament. You can change laws, you know, but the trouble is implementation and that's about personal in the institutions. And the faster you change here, you faster you interrupt things, the better it is. I think a, a procedure where we actually have too many, uh, too extensive um, uh, rules and procedures is actually a problem. Pass as a party has very much evolved around uh, uh, beliefs in meritocracy, in integrity, and there is a great leaning actually towards such kind of mechanisms. Of it, but I really look it, into the system. I think most of that is 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 really hardly implementable. I can tell that. Uh, for instance, the Adenauer Foundation has set up very early after Maya Sandu became president also advisory projects, uh, which are now continued with the government, also with the support of the German Foreign Office. Uh, I mean, if I make a call, the people who would be suitable would simply not apply. I, we need to do headhunting. It's quite simple because the people are not available. If you look into reliability, qualification, expertise needed, you know, also the time. Uh, in the end, it would end up if you if you would have too many positions that, that ministers, which which struggle to find state secretaries, would do a lot of job interviews now or sit on commissions on this or that. It's it's unfortunately, as the situation is unrealistic, the situation in the country with respect to reforms in that respect is far more dire, the lack of capacity far more dire. It really counts what kind of decisions are taken. It counts less how they are taken, I'm afraid at the moment. That would at least be my advice. This is not a promise that every decision which is going to be taken is going to be the right one. Uh, and that cannot be criticized, but speed and taking decisions is more important, I think, than how they are taken and that they are all uh, transparent. The final question I think was on China. Um, yes, China tried to, to, to also you know, benefit a little bit from COVID by sending aid, but overall, I think the role of China in Kishino is really rather marginal. I have not a complete overview of, of activity, but my it, the experiences I have was that China, for particular economically, was in certain conditions interested in investing, but then China has a very much much, you know, also return-based uh, approach to that kind of thing. So if they invest, for instance, in infrastructure, in companies and so on, they want to return. And conditions in Moldova, frankly speaking, in the past, uh, didn't appear to be very uh, attractive. So it was not ready, it wasn't a lack of readiness, I think, on the Chinese side, but that the Chinese concluded investing in Moldova for them uh, would simply not, uh, not be worth a dollar. And so we have very little uh, yeah, level of engagement uh, here. Yeah, I think that was the major points and I stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Um, we've reached the end of our discussion and I apologize for running over by 10 minutes, but I think it was really worth it because I think we had a really great conversation um, here today. I think we could have probably um, had this meeting for at least one and a half hours. Um, there's so many more things we could talk about or elaborate on. Um, I would like to thank all of the speakers for coming and giving us their assessments um, about Moldova and about the future. I think it was very um, interesting. I mean, it's clear that Moldova has reached another point, a very important point um, where it's time to do important reform to implement the reform and remain, you know, committed, committed to it um, and that the European Union gives the sufficient um, response in terms of support, um, financial assistance, um, etc. So the two both have, you know, a lot of things to do. Um, I'm hoping in this respect that we won't see another election in, in Moldova um, for many years. Um, definitely not for the next, you know, four years, I, I do hope. Um, otherwise, something would have gone um, very wrong. Um, so once again, thank you. Um, EPC will continue to follow um, developments in Moldova and the broader region um, throughout this year and the next. Um, thanks to the audience for joining us today and for their questions. And I wish everybody a really lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you.